the proposed plan, a very preliminary concept that we've put together for the meeting. We want to really importantly get your own feedback on that. And then lastly, we'll give you some expectations uh, about our next steps and time frames and those kinds of things. You may have heard a voice or you may have gotten a little pop up message that we are recording this meeting. I just started that recording. Um, we do that so that if you have a neighbor that's not able to be with us tonight, uh, but still might be interested in this, we'll make this um, uh, this uh, meeting available um, through the traffic calming website. I'll share uh, a link to that at the uh, conclusion of the, the program. You may already be familiar with it, but we house all of the, the recordings of the meetings there um, on that website. So feel free to uh, use that. Um, I think you all came in muted. We give you the ability to unmute yourself and welcome you to do that as we go through any of this material. We're a small group here. Most of these are, are small group meetings. and We like it that way. So feel free to unmute yourself, make a comment. You can also type that if you would rather in the chat box. I keep the little chat uh, open on my end so you can uh, feel free to use that as well. Uh, I think that's all the housekeeping I have. So. We'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, a little bit about the program. This is a residential street program. We don't do traffic calming really on, on in commercial areas or on uh, in, in industrial type streets. We really focus on residential streets. One is certainly because of safety, but the other is because we recognize that, that speeding and some of this uh, bad driving behavior can really be a quality of life issue. and um, Boy, I tell you, Green Lane is, is may get the uh, may take the prize for one of the most changed streets here recently. I know you all have had a, a lot of new houses being built along the street and all, and uh, part of that is you might like to just be out on the street walking. And sometimes we even hear people are nervous to go check their mailbox because of some of the the uh, speeding and all that happens along their street. So we recognize that, and uh, because of that, we focus on physical solutions. I'm going to give you some examples of what I mean by that, but we have found that nothing slows traffic down quite as effectively as putting something in the road, a speed hump or a, a or a uh, something to drop over or to drive around. And so we really focus on that aspect of traffic calming in the program here in Nashville. And we do focus on speed reduction. That sounds obvious. But sometimes people will engage us and say, you know, I would like for a lot of this traffic to go away off of the street. That's certainly understandable. That's generally not our focus. That's difficult to do, but also we don't want to just move a problem somewhere else. We we really try to tailor solutions to keep traffic where it is uh, in most cases, but just to slow it down and get it to, to drive, get traffic to, to operate more responsibly on your neighborhood streets. So um, it's a little bit about our objectives here. We do recognize that uh, this is not the only part of traffic calming. We, we call them the ease sometimes. Education can be a, an important part of that. We have a couple of tools geared toward uh, making sure people are aware of the speed limit, may be aware that they are speeding. That, that can be effective. Uh, enforcement is a big one. We had a call earlier today with MNPD and, and their role in, in speeding. And people often ask, you know, can't we just get uh, police to Put a cruise or a motorcycle out here, write a few tickets. I agree. I think that would help, at least in the short term. But as we all know, they do an incredibly important job and are just uh, stretched thin like uh, a lot of metro resources are and don't often have the time to, to dedicate strictly to traffic enforcement. So that's where we step in with the 30 being engineering. And, and that's what NDOT controls is all things within the right of way. And so we look at um, engineering tools and we like them because they're they're out there working 24 7. Uh, you know, the, when we do a traffic calming project it's not uh, generally something that uh, the effectiveness wears off we try to uh, you know make that street kind of self-policing as it were uh, for the longer longer term so those are some uh, some considerations that we look at Sometimes we, we reinforce the idea about why we do traffic calming in the first place and why speed is such a critical uh, aspect, both again from safety and from a livability standpoint. This is just one example. Uh, we could look at a lot of safety data, but this is one we like to really point to. Um, there's a, a, a 
large and growing body of evidence dealing with um, crash statistics between pedestrians and and uh, and cars, and so we know that there is a huge difference uh, when a car is speeding versus when they are operating at a at a lower level of speed. You know the the chance of survivability, if in the unfortunate event there is a pedestrian crash, uh, you have a much higher chance of surviving that incident if if the car is going you know in that twenty five mile an hour range. So. Um, that's a kind of a sobering statistic there, uh, but really points to the need for good speed management in our neighborhoods. Traffic calming continues to be an incredibly popular uh, uh, program of Metro. That's not always a good thing, but uh, it is good that we do have resources and are able to address some of the worst issues uh, in the county. Uh, in the cohort that you all are in, uh, that was back about a year, uh, not, uh, not quite a year ago, last summer, uh, we had over 500 applications. We just closed our latest window with an, a, another 200 or so applications. And so the demand just continues to grow. And we just say that to say, you guys are not alone out there. Um, some of the issues that you all have seen on, on your street, we're seeing in all corners of Davidson County. And uh, so um, that's uh, not a good thing. Uh, continues to stretch our resources, but it is a good thing in that uh, you all have been selected. You don't have to worry about funding and that kind of thing anymore. You're in the program, you've been selected. And so we're going to, we're going to work with you to develop a, a program, uh, hopefully that, that meets your expectations. Uh, just to put the 500 neighborhood streets in some context, we typically do about 50 a year, 25 in two different uh, application windows. Uh, this past year, there was some surplus uh, budget that council saw fit to allocate a portion of that to traffic calming, which we're very grateful for. They're big supporters of the program, and so we were able to do a few more streets than that. And Green was really a recipient of some of that additional funding, so it was a good thing. Um, we do like to always remind people of Hub Nashville. If you're not familiar with it, Hub is a uh, is kind of the online clearinghouse for all things metro government requests related. So uh, there is an app, but you can also just go to hub.nashville.gov. You can also call 311 and just talk to someone if you'd rather do that. And um, we, we say this here because sometimes there are some services that people are asking for in conjunction with traffic calming that we just can't offer in this program. Things like, you know, sidewalk construction or uh, even if, if additional signage, you know, if a, if a stop sign gets knocked down or whatever, your your best go to is is Hub Nashville. That gets sent to the correct um, place in Metro, gets to the right person the quickest, and it also is the ability has the ability to keep a log of that and give some feedback, make sure all those requests are documented. So uh, Hub's a great tool. If you're not familiar with it, check it out. It's not just NDOT. It's got uh, pretty much every Metro. Uh, department represented there. So really a nice service for those of us in Davidson County. Um, back to how we select these projects uh, within the program. Um, about 70% of the um, scoring criteria that we use comes from data that you probably expect. It's how much traffic is on the street, the traffic volume, and um, how fast that traffic is going. So those two things, when, when those 500 requests come in, we get busy in collecting that data uh, for, for those applications. And then 70% of our score comes from those two data points. The other, the other 30% come from more of that uh, uh, safety and livability issue from a, a multimodal or a non-driver perspective. Typically that's pedestrians, but it can also be bicyclists and transit users and those types of things. And so 15% of that has to do with, is there a documented instance of a pedestrian crash on the street? 10% of that has to do with, um, is there just no other way for a pedestrian to walk? I know Green, I think has sort of spotty sidewalks. Some of those have been built by, as, those, as the new houses have come in, built by the developer, which is a great thing. Uh, but there's still a lot of gaps of sidewalks on your street and as you know all over Nashville and so 
if you don't have sidewalks in the street, that actually boosts your score. Uh, with the philosophy being, you know, there's just not another safe way for a person to use the street uh, outside of a vehicle. And then five, the other 5% comes from, are there destinations in the area that make it more likely a person wants to walk? Are there things like schools or parks or uh, those types of things? And so uh, um, we have a, a, a way to do that for all of these requests, collect all that data and roll all of that into a, a scoring system. And then we take the top projects out of that. And so for better or worse, uh, green is one of those. And so uh, that's why we're here doing a project on, on this street. Here's some of that data specific to your street. We are going the entire length of the street. The project limits are from White's Creek Pike to Ninth uh, Drive. Um, 85th percentile speed is the way we say that. It's just a statistical way that we in our industry look at, at speeding. Uh, for this street, it's 34 miles an hour. Um, it's a, of course, it's a 25 mile an hour um, posted speed limit, which is relatively new. Um, but at 34, that's probably slightly below the average uh, of the, the speeds that we see on these um, uh, uh, these streets. So that, that's a good thing. We're probably in the, a little bit lower um, uh, realm there. Traffic volume is average, maybe a little above the average in that in that aspect. Here, at, uh, a little over 2,600 cars a day. We we say those numbers. A lot of times, people are shocked that there's that much traffic on your street. And, that doesn't shock us. That's not a huge volume, but it's it's a good, healthy volume and it helps get you uh, in the program. And then the street width here is somewhere around 20, 21 feet wide. That is on the on the more narrow uh, end of the spectrum for metro streets. Not a not a bad thing. In fact, that's going to work to our advantage as we develop a a traffic calming program. Just because we know the wider the street and the, and the more visually wide it looks, that tends to increase people's speed. Um, if houses are up close and trees are up close to the road and you have a pretty narrow uh, width of pavement there, that usually works to our advantage in terms of slowing traffic down. And then the length of this project is about three quarters of a mile. Here's a map we like to use just to, to, to visually put that. I know it's not the most sophisticated, but these colors do mean something. So let me uh, take a second and explain these. Um, uh, I'm seeing some uh, feedback on the uh, chat. It, it's, it looks like it, uh, someone may be having some trouble seeing the screen. Is that it? But is it okay for most everyone? Looks. Let me let me scan down through. Okay. I'm I'm going to keep going, but y'all keep typing there if uh, yeah if you can't get that brought back up. Thanks for that feedback. Um, this is a this is a, a a map that is available. It is an interactive map. This is just one screen shot from that. You can pan all over Davidson County with this map and zoom in and out. And it's available on the NDOT website. Uh, and what it's showing you is the status of different traffic calming projects in the county. Yours is kind of that pea green color right there where that big arrow is pointing to. That just indicates that you're in the program and we're working with you through this meeting and design process. And you see a couple of others maybe uh, in the area. But you see a lot of other colors too. And there's a, there's a guide over there on the left hand, or excuse me, on the right hand side that explain what all those colors mean. But a couple that we would point out, are, one is the blue lines, um, especially the blue dashed lines that you might find in this map close to you. We point those out because those indicate that there has been a traffic calming project completed on that street. So as we go into this and we start talking about traffic uh, speed cushions, for instance, uh, this map may give you some indication about where you can go in Nashville and see that and drive on those and experience those and see how you like them. The other uh, color I would call your attention to is kind of the, the purple pink color, the pin line. That just means that there's an application already on file. And I'll point that out to say, you know, if, as you drive around and you wonder, you know, if this street has um, an application or might have issues, you can go here and you can see if we already have an application on it. You don't need to do that one again. The, the other color just mean that they're in the program, they're in various stages of completion or waiting or we're waiting on the contract or whatever those mean. 
So um, a lot of colors on that map, but uh, it's, a, it's a good resource if you're interested in finding out more about traffic calming uh, near you. Next thing I'm gonna do is go through some of the tools that we have uh, in the program um, and, and really define these, especially focusing on the ones that uh, you're gonna see in just a minute on the, the concept that we have for the street. We start with speed cushions. This is by far the most common tool that we use. Um, it is the bread and butter of this program for a couple of reasons. Um, the, the main one being they work pretty well. Uh, so we've got a, a lot of experience now and in Nashville with the speed cushion. Uh, we order these from a, a vendor and uh, bear with me. We order these from a vendor. And uh, so that means they come, they come looking the same and performing the same every single time. We really like that consistency uh, across the county. So um, there are still a few legacy uh, speed cushion applications out there, speed humps or different configurations, but uh, anything that we've put out in probably the past uh, five, six, seven years has been this same uh, speed cushion. Uh, it's a recycled rubber, very dense. Um, and it, uh, those little arrows that you see are reflective, so they show up well at night. Uh, in that upper left-hand corner, you do see our typical signage that, that accompanies these, uh, the, the standard yellow warning sign. That also brings some more visibility to the, the speed cushion on the ground. They're only about three inches tall, but uh, that's, that's generally enough uh, to slow traffic down. Um, you don't have to go super slow over them. You know, you've probably been behind people that, that slow down almost to a stop before going over these. I know I certainly have. You don't have to do that. Um, most cars, uh, you, can, uh, you can roll over these speed cushions at 20, 25 miles an hour. And, and be fine. Uh, and that's the intent to slow down. Uh, it's not intended to make you stop and go over these very, very slow. They, they don't feel like the speed bumps you might have in the Kroger or the Home Depot parking lot, uh, for instance. They're about six feet wide and you see those gaps in between the two cushions. Um, they're wide enough that uh, you're not able to straddle them with your car. Uh, I drive a, a full size pickup truck and I can get a little closer to straddle them, but I but you can't straddle a six foot wide uh, wheelbase. But the gaps are there and they're limited to six feet because there are some vehicles that come a little closer to straddling them, like ambulances and fire trucks. And that's the point is that those first responders uh, have less impact from the speed cushion uh, than other vehicles do. And so they don't have to slow down as much to, to get through these. And so that's that's the idea there. Um, another design feature that we have is the length of them. They come in a, uh, our standard length is a 10 and a half foot speed cushion that's in the direction along uh, the travel, in the direction of travel. But we can get them a little shorter, seven feet. We can get them a little longer, 14 feet. But we have found that our, our default, our go-to is really 10 and a half. But if we're in a, a really urban area like a Germantown or you know in East Nashville, we'll shorten those up and do a seven foot cushion. Uh, those are a little more aggressive. They bring about a, a slower, you know, something like a, a 15 mile an hour average speed. Or if we're in more of a rural area, uh, we might stretch out and do a 14 foot cushion if, if uh, you know, uh, we want to air toward the side of comfort a little more and less on speed reduction. So again, that's why we have found 10 and a half to be our, our go-to uh, cushion. It just is kind of the best of both worlds. The only other thing I would point out here is you see different configurations. Sometimes there's two, sometimes there's three. In the bottom right-hand picture, you see three plus some little uh, white plastic sticks. They're, we call them delineators. The point of all of that is just to make sure that we've got good coverage from one side of the road to the other. Uh, we don't wanna leave enough of a gap that anybody can drive around these even if that means driving around in somebody's yard, we have cases we know people will do that. And so we work really hard to make sure that these speed cushions go from one, one side of the pavement to the other. We don't literally have to go edge to edge, as you see here, but we do need to make sure that there's not big gaps that, that would be big enough to let a person uh, drive through or attempt to drive through. So that's the other point about that. Um, there's a close cousin to the speed cushion, the speed table. 
same manufacturer makes these. It's essentially the same idea. It just doesn't have that gap in the middle. We we have really backed off of using these in all but very few, very special circumstances. Again, because we really we really um, respect that uh, and will promote that emergency vehicle access. So, um, you know, unless there's something really special going on, you see these in parks sometimes. For instance, you know, that a, a route that's not going to be used hardly at all for a, a emergency response. But anyway, uh, we do have that tool uh, in the toolbox. Both of those work. Um, so similarly that we we present some before and after speed uh, speed data here. Um, every street's a little different. Uh, you know, I caution to really make predictions about how how speed might work. Every driver's different. Every street's different. Every application is a little bit different. But we do know uh, that this these work uh, when we when we put them in and space them correctly and and so forth. And this is just some data showing that from some of our earlier applications that we were seeing about a, a nine to 12 mile an hour speed reduction uh, when, when the cushion's going in. So that's a good thing. You know, if you're starting, if y'all are at 34, uh, we might expect you to be down around that 25 mile an hour speed, which is perfect. That's exactly what we're targeting for is that speed limit. Um, another tool that we do have kind of gets into that realm of, um, education that we talked about just making sure people understand the speed limit and more importantly how fast they're actually going sometimes people uh, and this may be true on a street like green green lane you get out there and you're kind of going down the road and before you know it you're doing 45 and it, it doesn't even feel like it. you just don't even notice it so sometimes we'll use radar feedback signs it's not very often that we will mix and match uh, a feedback sign with speed cushions the reason is, um, you know, if we put cushions down, we're, we're pretty certain that traffic is going to be lowered down into that 20, 25 mile an hour. And at that point, there's really not much sense in, in you know, giving them feedback that they are, in fact, going uh, nice and slow. Instead, we usually use these where we can't put a speed cushion, sometimes on big hills or sharp curves or if there's um you know some other restriction or limitation on, on a different type of a tool we will use these we'll also use these on streets that there's just too much traffic on you know we we have not moved into um, traffic calming on some of our major arterials like you know white's creek pike or clarksville pike or something like that uh, instead we might use a feedback sign for one of those applications but it can be a good tool it also has some before and after data um, but uh, I think the jury's still out about how long lasting that is. You know, if you go by this thing every day, it probably does have some impact early on. But as you as you get used to seeing it, um, you know, there's still some question about does that effectiveness last uh, over the long term. Another tool that we do sometimes, not very often, but occasionally we will do some visual narrowing using striping. Uh, again, as you mentioned earlier, uh, the wider a street looks, uh, sometimes that will encourage speeds. But we have to be careful here because, like in this picture, if we introduce a center line, that double solid yellow line, um, sometimes that communicates that it is a more major street may actually increase speeding. So uh, we, we do this judiciously where the, where the case fits here. Bear with me a second, I'm going to read. Um, there's a question here from Daniel, are the uh, cushions narrow enough, 18 wheelers can avoid them. Um, yeah, if you have semi trucks, those are probably gonna have a, a wider wheelbase as well. And so um, uh, they're, they're not gonna be able to completely avoid them. They probably will come closer to behaving more like a fire truck or something that they, they, can, um, they can have a lesser impact. But that's a that's a really good point, and so we'll we'll take that note there and consider that um, as we look at that. But um, oh, because and so you're saying FedEx, and my first thought was you know the box truck that makes the deliveries, but you're talking about literally a FedEx 18 wheeler because you have uh, I guess you all have the, the UPS and the FedEx facilities out there by you. So yeah, you probably are seeing some of that. But let's let's hold that and and bring that back up when we look at the plan. Good, very good point there. Um, bull mountain chicanes uh, are, are another uh, 
another tool we have. These are these are more for urban areas and more at intersections. You guys just don't have a lot of intersections along this um, project, <clears throat> but sometimes intersections were built really wide. There's just a lot of pavement out there, and so people will complain about turning in and out of the street very quickly. So we have some tools to address that. Uh, we have the traffic circle again, uh, kind of a special that, that everything has to line up just right for these to to work and to not create some other unintended consequences. We we have installed some of these that school buses have had some trouble navigating and so forth. So uh, again, um, we look very carefully before uh, introducing traffic circles, but they can be a good tool at intersections as well. And that brings us to. Uh, the plan for this street, I, I should say the concept. This is intentionally kind of cartoony and not very detailed because that gives us a, a lot of ability to change things and move things around, just depending on your feedback. Um, so let me explain what we're looking at here. This is um, uh, from the left side of your screen. You can see the stop sign there at White's Creek Pike, and then it, it progresses that uh, three quarters of a mile over to the right side of your screen at night drive and you see the, the KIPP label there for the school. Um, this, uh, I mentioned earlier in the meeting that this, uh, this neighborhood has changed a lot. You see a lot of the new houses here, but I think there's been a lot more, it seemed to me, as I was out there uh, last week. Uh, a lot more has been built there along the street than what even shows here. So I'm aware it's a, a little bit of a different land use configuration that we're looking at. I, I hope that this this configuration still works, but we'll be we'll be taking a look at that. And so what I'm showing here along the purple line, which is your street, is six sets of speed cushions. Uh, this looks a lot like what we propose on on many streets uh, around Nashville. Is pretty much a, a straight uh, speed cushion design. Um, as we look at the length, the way we come up with six, for instance, is we'll look at the total length of that. In this case, it's a little over 4,000 feet long. And then we'll break that up by a desired spacing. So our desired spacing, we know from experience what works well is if we can be in that 400 to 600 foot range, um, that's close enough together that uh, traffic doesn't go over one set of speed cushions and then step on the gas just to get to the next one. By the time they go over the first set of speed cushions, you see the next one coming up and, and most drivers, not all, but most drivers will, will be prudent and, and kind of just say, okay, I'm, I'm going the speed I should, I'm just gonna go on up to the next one and they will progress down the length of that street, uh, hopefully in, in, that, in that 25 mile an hour average range. Um, but it's not so, um, it's not too close uh, to where it just becomes obnoxious for you all who have to drive on these every day and, and potentially pushes traffic somewhere else. I'm not really too afraid of that. Uh, I, I don't think there are a lot of opportunities for an alternative route uh, in this area. And that's probably why your traffic volume for as, as few houses are on the street is as high as it is. It just becomes the the cut through or the, the, the primary way, I guess, over to the interchange there on White's Creek Pike to get up to, to Brawley. So um, I don't expect that to change. I wouldn't expect to see a major shift in the volume of traffic, but hopefully if we were to, able to put these in uh, at that spacing, we would see a good consistent slow speed down the, the length of the street. A couple of considerations that, that we have to watch on this, um, two of them aren't applicable to you, and that is, the, you know, the presence of, of hills or slopes. We don't have anything that's going to keep us from, from putting cushions there because of that. Or um, turns, curves in the road. Um, we, don't, we don't put speed cushions if, a, if we have kind of a sharp curve in the road. We don't want cars to be turning and going over cushions at the same time. But I really like you have that, and this is a pretty straight shot, except for that one little curve right up there near Tisdale, Tisdale Drop. Um, but what we do have a lot of is the third consideration, which is driveways. And again, I think you've got more than we even show on this on this uh, image here. That's going to be one of the challenges as we look at um, trying to spot these speed cushions. Is our, our policy is we really try to work hard to not put a, a speed cushion within 15 feet of somebody's driveway. You, you really don't want to drive over these every time you're turning in and out of your driveway, and we don't want you to be doing that. So we, we try to spot those just where you can you can get in and out of your driveway and not have to, to roll over one of these. 
But when those driveways become very closed, particularly if they're sort of offset across, you know, from across the street, your neighbor across the street, it can it can get pretty tricky to try and spot these in. So we'll do the best we can uh, with that. But uh, in any case, uh, this is this is the plan that, that we have now, just given that space and given what we think will work best to to do an effective uh, traffic calming application with these six set of so speed cushions. It would look more like uh, what you got down at that little picture down at the bottom of, of this slide, the two cushion configuration. Again, it's a narrow street. Uh, so two cushions would be plenty to, to cover us. We wouldn't have to do three. We wouldn't have to do any kind of uh, additional coverage on the outside. We would have those signs. The, the signs do a good job of, of uh, uh, preventing someone from trying to drive around the outside. No one wants to drive through one of those steel uh, street signs if they can help it. So. I've done a lot of talking and I'm going to stop there. So if anybody wants to um, come off of mute and express excitement or dismay or frustration or anything with, with what they're seeing on this plan, that's what we're here for. And we would love to hear from you and get your feedback on that and maybe some specific issues. If somebody wants to talk more about the tractor trailers, that'd be great too. Uh, yeah. Hey, Jeffrey, uh, I will start. This is Katie. Um, thank you for doing this. Uh, quick question about the uh, speed cushions. And uh, the only thing I'm worried about, that sounds great. The only thing I'm worried about is, is noise. Um, and, you know, it might be a lesser of two evil situations. But since Dan mentioned, like, we have a ton of tractor trailers and landscape trailers and this trailer and that trailer and it's already bumpy when somebody go you know we'll have those steel plates in the road from construction all that sort of stuff um and it sounds like a bomb's going off when somebody drives over one uh yeah. so that's the only thing i worry about with the speed cushions and i just wonder does making them longer help with that to reduce the the don't you know the thud that happens or just your thoughts on that thank you yeah it's a good question i i I I have I really don't have any experience of you know does making them longer help. Um, it would kind of stand a reason, wouldn't it? That if it you know it, if it were longer and more gradual, you may not get that. But you know if you're pulling a landscape trailer with lawnmowers in the back of it, it's probably going to rattle just the way it would if they hit a pothole or something like that. On the other hand, uh, most of those guys, if you, you know if you're pulling a trailer they're going to slow down probably more than the average car will, you know, with the consideration that, you know, if you hit that thing fast enough, it's going to bump and you're going to, you don't want to lose some content. Sure. We, we have not had those complaints um, uh, as far as, you know, it, it being just exceptionally loud. Uh, and we're, we're to the point now where we've put these on a lot of different streets and a lot of different, uh, you know, types of neighborhoods in terms of some, some streets, the houses set way back off the road. And so they're probably not going to complain, but others in, in very dense urban environments, um, and, and we don't hear a lot of noise complaints, but if, if you go to a place where we put these in and you stand there, you're going to hear a car go over and you hear them being hit, but it's just kind of a. It's not a, it's not generally a loud clanging. It's not, you know, it's probably not as loud as hitting a pothole. It's it, because it is rubber. It's sort of, um, it's sort of, uh, cushions some of that, uh, perhaps, but I, I would say you'd hear, but, if, but, but if, again, if it's not there, you hear the whoosh of the car going by too. So it's a, it's a, it's a probably a toss up, but I would say they're not exceptionally loud. At least we don't get a lot of complaints about that. Yeah, that that makes sense. I think it's like I said, the lesser of two evils. You know, I'd rather not have somebody flying down at sixty miles an hour. I'd rather hear a bump. I guess. Um, yeah. So that makes sense. Thank you. I'll let yeah, anybody sure. else with questions. Hi, this is Robert Millage. I live at Vista at White's Creek. Um, I'd like to know currently. We've got four dips in this road out here on Greens Lane, and I drive a car with a low-profile tire, and I'm not sure exactly the diagrams that you're speaking of because I couldn't access uh, the, the WebEx through a virtual at all. In fact, if it wouldn't have been for Katie posting it on Facebook, I would have been totally unaware of this meeting. 
And I have been like a strong proponent of uh, being the president of this local community on a traffic calming plan that was inclusive of a traffic light at Green's Lane and White's Creek. Now, is this meeting at all in conference that traffic light, or are we only talking about speed bumps? We're talking about speed bumps. Um, we we typically don't get into changes to actual traffic control, uh, you know, regulatory traffic control things. You get a ticket if you don't obey. Um, that would be a good case for the hub that I mentioned earlier. Um, if, if you haven't made that request to Metro through that avenue, that would be the thing to do. But that's a that's a higher bar. And so if you're talking about a traffic light, what what happens is you would make that request, and they would, and maybe they maybe you've done that, and maybe they've done this. They would come out and do um, uh, an engineering study where they would count the number of cars. There are some warrants that have to be met in terms of like thresholds for traffic volume. Uh, it goes through all that. They make a recommendation, and then it has to go to a a standing board of Metro called the Traffic and Parking Commission. They are the ones that actually decide whether there would be a traffic light or not. In addition to funding, and and with funding, just so you know, you're probably talking about uh, for an intersection like that, 150 to 200 thousand dollars for a traffic signal. So. Not out of the question. Certainly, something you should continue to ask about if that's a you know if that's a, an interest and you feel like it's a safety issue pulling out on the White's Creek Pike and you know designating well, that traffic control. Go ahead. You still there? Yes, I'm still here. Okay. Um, yeah. I had actually worked with Jennifer Gamble on this, and I actually have emails from last year uh, that I, I still have in my email where she speaks to the traffic calming uh, plan and that funding was allocated last year. And in fact, I've had some communication with Devin over at NDOT mm -hmm. about the traffic light situation. And when Jennifer Gamble emailed me and said that these plans were like inclusive of a traffic light because Metro's agreement on this traffic light at White's Creek and Green's Lane was established between Gen 5 Development, Old South, and TriStar. And that Old South had committed once they completed their current housing project on Green's Lane that they, Gen, a, Gen 5 and TriStar, would split the cost of funding a traffic light at that intersection. The problem was that this is three to five years out. We have an accident at that intersection at least once a month involving multiple police cars, multiple ambulances, and typically the stopping of traffic. And as to the funding, as I pointed out to Jennifer Gamble at that time, and she agreed with me. You know, during the pandemic, they raised all of our property taxes here, claiming that we were gonna go without essential services and, you know, originally they planned on doing it citywide and then they started just targeting areas. And we were the, one of the targeted areas where our property tax shot up. Mine went, I don't know, up about six or $700. And I am only one of 43 homes in this community. And I pointed out that, you know, they they upped our property tax based on you know lack of tourism and now tourism is a, at an all time high, and that this community and the people that live along Green Lane should not have to wait for three to five years for something to be funded because that was the agreement when our property tax has already really funded this. 
and $250,000 to the city is a drop in the bucket. And in our conversation, she was in agreement with me that the city should fund it and that you guys can get your monies on the backside from Gen 5 Old South and TriStar. And I've actually got the emails from July of last year that shows all of this. And, and here we're talking about putting in speed bumps, which is a, a good thing. I agree with that along Green Plain. You got a school down there. It'd be nice if the traffic calming program or plan would be inclusive of how you're not gonna stop traffic flow along Knights Drive and Greens Lane where parents are either dropping their children off or picking their children up because traffic comes to, to a dead stop because you're waiting for that traffic to clear. Uh, additionally, if you're pulling off a night drive on the Greens Lane, that is a real narrow turn. Um, you know, for whoever's listening, you probably need to widen that road a bit into the drainage ditch to allow people a little wire, wider turn burst to go from Knight's Drive up Green Plain. Now, currently, yeah. I don't know whether these four dips in the road that we got over here in Green's Lane were put there because of the new construction or whether this is part of your test pattern. Because again, you know, I, I couldn't get to the virtual end of this. I'm speaking to you by phone. And I okay. tried everything okay. under the sun to get into this virtual meeting. And I would have thought you would have just did a Zoom like we've always done in the past. Yeah. Um, Unfortunately, we're uh, on a Metro but, system, which is WebEx, so that's that's what they use. So that's what we're using. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I, but if you want to, if you want to, I know you, I know you can't see the chat and all. If you want to um, somehow leave me, maybe maybe as we sign off before we sign off, if you want to leave me an email address, I'll be happy to email you a link. I'll just to give it to you right now. You okay. can just okay. write it down. Right? I mean, I'm open to whoever wants to email me in this group. <laughs> All right. It's Robert dot Millage, M I L L A G E, one one zero at gmail dot com. Now the next so, question I have is: Are these four dips in the road? Is this your test pattern, or are these just dips in the road that occurred trying to get the utilities from one side of the road to the other to the new construction along there? I have no knowledge of dips in the road, so I'm interested to hear about it and, and what, what we'll do when we come out. This is not the most detailed thing. I know you can't see it, but for those, this is not the most detailed thing you will see. We will actually have a, a set of design plans that shows the proposal. Um, and when we come out and, and develop that, we will note those dips in the road. I'm glad you mentioned that. We'll be on the lookout for them. I don't know how they got there or oh, what they are. They're you certainly you, they, you ain't going to be able to miss them. them. Okay. Yeah, you will not be able to miss them. I can help one add some color to that. Uh, I can help add some color to that. So there are some houses that are getting built um, and they run their utilities across the road and they do that quick patch job with just the quick asphalt and then they usually come back and smooth it over later. Uh, so pretty much all of us that have had our houses built had those thick bumps for a while, they'll get smoothed out. It's it's annoying and frustrating and adds to the noise, but um, that's that's what it is. So we're just waiting on the contractors to come smooth that out. Well, if you go from White's Creek Pike down Green's Lane, there's like about four of them in a row. Yeah, I, I hear you, Robert. One, I mean, they're, they're in front of my house. That, I, hear that, you. That, I hear everything. That third one is pitiful. I don't know who they hired to do this you know, ripping the road up and putting it back together, but they've done a pitiful job of it. I drive a white Genesis G70 with low profile tires. I have to come to a complete stop before I hit that third one. There's no way my car would go over that without destroying the tires at 30 miles an hour. So for whoever's in the room that can get that fixed, <laughs> In the interim, while we await these speed bumps, 
that would be great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of issues there. And, and you know, that's what growth does. Growth, you know, brings a, a lot of issues and all. And I'm, I'm sorry you're dealing with those. It's probably not too uncommon. But unfortunately, m my scope here is pretty limited. And that is how, how do we lower speed on Green Lane? And I know you got uh, other things at, at intersections and the school drop offs and all of that. But we're really focused on what what we can offer in terms of lowering speeds on green lights. So that's what we're we're talking about here. And unfortunately, that's the only tools I have. If you want to, when you email, when we email back and forth, Ms. Millage, um, uh, anything you want me to pass along to the project managers I have, I'm happy to do that. But that's kind of the extent of, of what I can do on some of those other issues. Okay, great. Well, I wasn't sure, like I said, if it wasn't for the gal that posted it on Facebook and the White's Creek uh, uh, Facebook page, I would have been totally unaware of this. Yeah. It's funny, typically I'm not, I'm included and I receive a notification for all the meetings because I am the president of the HOA here at White, at Vista at White's Creek. Um, I well, I, I can tell you, the... I, I'll tell you how, how we notified this meeting, and it's important because going forward, we'll continue to do that. And so um, we send postcards out. So hopefully some of y'all got the postcards. We send those out to anybody who owns property that abuts Green Lane. So if your address is Green Lane, you, 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 I mean, and you own the property, you should have gotten that postcard. No, I, I actually live on Del Sol, which is one street off of Green's Lane. Okay. But I have, uh, I don't know, about eight, about eight or nine homeowners that live on Green's Lane. Okay. And, you so, know, so they probably is, got a card, but you may not have. Right. And, and the problem is that, you know, there's 43 homeowners in this community and Green's Lane is the only way in and out of our community. Yeah. We have to take Green's Lane to get in or out. Sure. And, uh, you know, as for um, a semi trucks coming down this road, that shouldn't be happening, especially FedEx. That should not be happening. Now, lawn care companies and their trailers, I see a lot of that, but it's clear and it's posted somewhere along here uh, up on the main road that FedEx drivers are not to be coming down Green's Lane. And this is a road that is definitely not intended for any kind of semi-truck traffic. So um, it, is is that already signed? Is there a no truck um, symbol sign already posted on the road? Is there's like two separate things. So there's a no, there's two no truck signs right as you turn right from White's Creek Pike, and then as you're on exit 19, there's a few signs that say FedEx trucks must turn left and take yeah. a night drive, basically, which they just both collectively ignore. Yeah. Well, I mean, at that point, it just becomes kind of an enforcement issue. It's not surprising that they just do it anyway, because there's really no repercussion to them. Um, the only people that can enforce that is um, is MNPD, I think. I don't think that NDOT's traffic enforcement, which is really pretty much just parking, they write parking tickets. I don't think they have purview over that issue it would take him in PD actually coming up and doing patrol to, to write tickets to truck drivers doing that. Otherwise, you know, it's probably just going to happen. And, and I don't have a lot of tools, um, you know, aside from these speed cushions, maybe they, they won't like them and, and decide it's not worth the trouble to come down green lane. Um, but that's about the only thing I, I can really you know, say. No, quite honestly, I, if, if... If they're coming up Green's Lane off a of night's drive, I don't know how they're doing it because yeah, that intersection that is so yeah. narrow. Yeah. It's ridiculous. If a car is already sitting there at the stop sign facing night's drive and say you're coming up night's drive from Brick Church Lane, you practically have to just kind of like stop and almost let them do whatever they're going to do before you have enough room to turn Otherwise, you may end up in the drainage ditch. That's how narrow that the mouth of that road is at Night's Drive. 
Hey, Jeff, can I uh, ask another question? So another concern we have um, a lot of us is, is like we mentioned, getting our mailboxes smoked by cars slash trucks. Um, and if we have to walk on the street, uh, which like, you know, either walking the dog or walking down to the gas station or whatever, um, obviously there's not a lot of space to walk. My only question was, is there some type of, I mean, we only have so much road to get to work with. I understand that in the width. Is there any type of striping we can do or anything to help uh, let people know that pedestrians might be walking on the street? Uh, remind me what's there in terms of an edge line or a center line. Or sure. Neighbor. So in the section um, that uh, that gentleman was speaking about, the neighborhood that's right at the close uh, corner of White Creek Pike and Green Line, they have a nice sidewalk and a nice uh, bike lane. So they're they're good on that side. And then the opposite side of the, them on that street, we got the gas station that then goes into a non sidewalk area, but at least you can walk on the other side. Then there's this whole middle no man's land where a lot of us on this call live, um, where there's nothing but ditches on either side. Um, so Dan, Derek, correct me if I'm wrong, are there white stripes on the outside of the road? I can't see. I do believe there's white stripes. Okay. So, and then, you know, obviously, like I said, there's not that much road to work with because you're going to end up in the ditch. But I don't know if, like Derek mentioned earlier, doing some of those like little white poles or something or um, if there's just anything we can do to try to protect, you know, either the mailboxes obviously can be replaced, but people can't be replaced if they get smoked by a car. Sure. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look here. Um, it, it looks like uh, from Google, this is from 2022, that there is both edge lines and a center line. Um, and the only thing I was going to suggest is that edge lines would be helpful there, you know, if it wasn't. It, if, it, if the edges of the road were not very visible and so you know people were just getting over too close to the edge and hitting mailboxes and stuff that yeah. shouldn't be the case now we one thing we can do is uh to look back at the condition of we can refresh those yeah maybe brighten them up project. or yeah something like that that, that can help sometimes uh, we'll look at the payment schedule if they're gonna if they're gonna resurface it in the next year or two we probably wouldn't spend the money to do that but um in this picture anyway but of course, this goes back to 2019. Uh, they're pretty worn, but we we can do that. There's not, there's just not enough room at at 20 feet. That's about the minimum we can do with two lanes. You know, that's two 10 foot lanes, and uh, we just don't do anything narrower than that. And so, um, there's just not enough room to have any kind of a walking path or anything, or even a shoulder. That, that the edges of the road are your road. The road I live on is the same way. There's just yeah. not a, there's just no room to the outside there. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. If I'm not mistaken, though, up around um, where they're doing the old South project up Green Lane, they do have some kind of edge pole there. Uh, doesn't run for very far, and it might have been something the old South did. Um, but unfortunately, Green's Lane is so narrow and the traffic does whip down there. I hear cars going down there that are, uh, you know, like a Mustang or something. And the way it sounds like they must be thinking the road's like a, a private dragway. I mean, they do get going that fast on it. Um, yeah, and, and trying to, go ahead. Uh, and, you know, I mean, these folks here, you know, this is our community. We should be able to walk in our community safely with their pets, with their children, without fear of being hit by a car because the road just isn't wide enough. That's what the real thing is here along this green lane. The road is not wide enough. Yeah. And and, and particularly during drop off times for school and pick up times, <laughs> I have begged throughout the, this whole process for somebody to develop a plan and give the instruction to the elementary school so that those of us that use that road as a throwaway are not sitting there for 20 minutes trying to get 50 feet down the road to the stop sign because we're sitting in a line 
of parents waiting to pick up their children. Yeah, so There's just no way around that. Jeffrey, just to get back to uh, to things we can change here. So as far as the speed cushions go, um, I, I think the only thing to really discuss probably is the the width of, or like how many of them are there, two versus three versus the table or whatever, and then how long they are. I think Dan made a great point about the 18 wheelers. The other point I would make is um, motorcycles. We have a lot of like crotch rockets that come ripping through here so that they can get back on Briley Parkway and make their loop or whatever. Um, so part of me likes the idea of having a, a table or whatever where they couldn't slice through it, but I understand the yeah. emergency vehicles and stuff need to need to get through as well. So um, just would like to hear everyone's thoughts um, on on how many or how long they are or whatever. I joined this meeting late. I mean, I'm a fan of four to six traveling the, the length of Green's length. Because he has once six shown on, on, his, uh, on his screen. So uh, six is what's in the plan right now. Okay, yeah. And that they'd be spaced out appropriately because once you get beyond the new construction uh, of the uh, shotgun homes, which is uh, the side of the road closest to Briley, you still got about a good eighth of a mile or better to come to the stop sign at White's Creek. And, you know, you got a lot of impatient um, people, particularly people that are younger, that, you know, they're aggravated because they just went through five or six speed bumps and, and they're in a hurry that as soon as they get beyond that last one, they're going to be moving like a rocket to that stop sign at White's Creek Pike and Green's Lane. Well, so one thing I be spaced out appropriately throughout the. Yeah, that, that I didn't mention when we were talking about the spacing is that we, we typically will, that's a good point, I'm glad you mentioned that we typically will take that last one toward the ends of the project and move them, cheat them just a little bit closer to those intersections where we can, uh, just so that, you know, if you turn on to the street coming off of White's Creek or coming off of Knight, you encounter that first one just a little bit sooner. Uh, we'd rather you hit that one a little bit sooner before, you know, and then kind of set the stage for uh, what you're going to encounter on Green Lane. So that is that is um, something that we try to do. One thing you may not have heard was that, you, you know, the number of driveways here is a, is a concern for us. We're not going to put these directly in some in front of someone's driveway. And so I'm I'm really a little concerned about you know how many we can actually get when we get out on the street and trying to spot these in you know we're working off kind of an old aerial I know you can't see it an aerial image plan view image and we know that there's been a lot more house construction since this picture was taken and so uh, it may be a challenge to even get six sets it may not I, I hope we can but uh, I just want to kind of set that caveat there that we'll 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 get the best and the best spacing that we can given the the constraints we have with the number of driveways now. Hey Jeffrey, something I've okay. seen on on other streets around is painting the uh, speed limit on the road itself in like massive letters. Is that part of the plan, or yeah, um, does it, it do it, anything? I, <laughs> probably not, but we okay. can. Um, yeah, uh, but they kind of got away from that because, as, as y'all may know, your speed limit dropped. Within probably the past year, I think it used to be it was either 30 or 35 and, and they did a blanket reduction. Um, they did the they did the urban services district a couple of years ago, and then they came back and did all of the rest of the county, maybe last year, and it was reduced down to 25. We come to these meetings all the time and people say that doesn't do anything, that doesn't change anything. And and so they, they kind of got away from um, paint, painting it on the streets when it was already posted, especially just because people thought, well, number one, it could change again. And number two, it, 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 the effectiveness of that is, is not really known or understood. So we don't we don't do it very much, but um, yeah, maybe worth thinking about.
Good thoughts. But it, it sounds like, I mean, there's consensus on the presence of speed cushions. That's that's probably the number one thing we want to we want to take away from this meeting. If someone says, no, I hate those things. We don't want them. That's not this neighborhood. We just can't stand it. That would be good to hear. I don't hear that. I hear that, um, you know, this is the, 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 the probably the best tool that we have to slow traffic. You're, you're open to that. Um, we get into the details of, of where exactly they'll go, what the resulting spacing will be. We won't really know that until we go out and, and visit it and, and make some measurements. Uh, but it sounds like there's there's pretty much consensus on on this tool. Let me let me keep going through the rest of this. I, I know it's it's seven now, but let me go quickly so you have an expectation about uh, or, or information about what to expect from us. I'm glad to come back to that if there's more discussion on the on the plan. But just so you know, we're we're at this little red circle here. We're at the neighborhood meeting, and our next step will be to get into that more detailed design. We ask for two months. It it shouldn't take us quite that long um, to to um, come back to a design. It, and at that point, we have a choice to make. We used to do a mandatory two meetings. We would we would require us all to get back together again, just like we're doing tonight. But what we found was that a whole bunch of these meetings, probably 80% of the time, we'd get back together and we may have a little more detail, but it was pretty much what I just showed you. You know, it, it was six speed cushions and they're gonna be spaced as just so and all of that. And people said, well, I, I wish we hadn't put this off for two months. <laughs> I wish you had to just use that time and let's get going and move into the ballot process. So we made that meet, that second meeting is, is optional. If you guys want us to come back and represent you know the more formal plan we can do that or we can just kind of save that time and and move straight to the ballot if you choose to do that you still have the opportunity to see those plans we still put them on the website uh and then uh, and then go forward with the ballot anyway it's just a matter of do, do you want to get back together from uh, from what i hear from you it's probably not worth the time but if you want to do it i'm happy to i'm happy to do it i'm ready I'm to go ahead with the bumps Okay, uh, that's what most communities are, but that's certainly your option. If anybody has real opposition to that, let me know, and you know we, we can talk through that. Um, the the next step then after that design, and we put that on the the website, is the ballot process. I'm going to give you a little more information about that, and then here's the real kicker. Here's what I want to be sure y'all understand. We go through that ballot process. It's a six week. It's a six week um, process. If it passes, that really puts us into the real waiting game. And these right now are taking us about a year from the time that ballot passes to when these the, the speed cushions are actually installed out on the street. I know that's an unreasonable amount of time. I wish it wasn't that, that way. The construction is not that difficult. The construction is probably two days that they're out here doing that. but. The, the resources that Metro has with its contractor, it, it, it's just taking a long time. They're working on it and they're trying to speed that up. They've, I think, brought on another contractor. And so maybe maybe they'll make great strides uh, over that time and it won't take a year. But I just want to just want to let you know that's that's what it's taken. I don't want you to think by July 4th, there's going to be speed cushions out there because it's not going to happen that quickly. Is so, uh, Joy Kimbrough in attendance? I, I, let's see. She can speak up. I don't think I saw her name pop up. A so councilwoman for this district. She's not present at this meeting. I don't think so. No, she's okay. Um, um, that is a that is a a a kind of a council person interest issue. I understand why you asked that. When as soon as I say it takes a year, that that happens a lot. So when council members do attend these meetings up that is something they're usually interested in that's why i know ndot is working on it several council members have talked to the director they're trying to figure that out uh, there's a lot of emphasis uh, on that but feel free to lend your voice to that however y'all want to do it i just i just want you to I, my 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 main objective just let you know is it, it, there there is some time there i want you to uh, and is that. diana diana alacron still the director of ndot she is, yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. So a little bit about I, I want to I want to also um, clear up the balloting process. This is something that's mandatory. The the main idea is that we just want to be sure that everybody who 
um, you know, has property on the street, is aware of what is is uh, being looked at, and has the opportunity to to give feedback. We're going to send those cards out um, to people on the street. Um, it'll look a lot like what you got for this meeting. It'll have a, a QR code that'll take you to a Nashville.gov page where you will essentially give us some very basic information and vote yes or no. Uh, we're looking for two thirds of the people who vote um, to be in favor of it before we move that forward. Uh, now, it is, the, it is open for six weeks. Is the voting process only is it limited to just people on Greens Lane that live on Greens Lane? Because aside from our neighborhood, down below the Old South neighborhood that's being built down there, you have a huge neighborhood and they have no way of getting in and out of that neighborhood except on and off of Greens Lane. Yeah, and, and that is not and, unique to Greens Lane. Uh, virtually every traffic calming project that we do has at least a street like that, that is a dead end street, a cul-de-sac or something off of that. In, in many cases, there are many, many, maybe hundreds of, of properties that that is the case. They have to use the street. The policy decision that has been made is that we will only ballot people that actually live on Green Lane we recognize that there's it impacts a lot more houses than that and that people do have to use the street but it's kind of like where you draw the line you know in, in some of these places especially down in the antioch area where you know you just got neighborhoods off of neighborhoods and they all have to come back to that one street we would be balloting you know maybe hundreds of people and, and the other aspect is the people that don't live on Green Lane aren't affected by the speeding nearly as much. And so we, we just, we limit it to, for several reasons, we limit it to the people who actually have a property that abuts the Green Lane right of way. Yeah. And just to okay. reassure Robert here, our, our middle, middle Green Lane contingent is strong and this will, it'll pass. So no, no need to worry. We'll be fine. Well, trust, trust me, I mean, if you live on Green Lane, I know that you hear the cars whipping down through there and the motorcycles. I live oh, yeah. one street okay. off of Green yeah, Lane. Yeah, we, we hear them, and we I hear still them hear every them. day. Every day, every night, oh, every yeah. minute. So we're, we're good. We're, yeah. we're aware. So we it would be uh, great if they put up a sound wall for the UPS trucks that are banging at 3 and 3.30 in the morning. I don't know if you have. hear it, but I... I definitely hear it. <laughs> yeah, in my perfect utopia, there'd be a nice little sound bubble right around my house. Uh, but Alex, I'll take the I'll take the speed cushions, uh, baby steps. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we do ballot the owners of those properties. So if you have a neighbor that rents, they they will not get that card. That would go to the landlord. Um, uh, if if there's someone who owns multiple properties, they only get one card just get one chance to vote um, if they're properties that are vacant um, uh, and I don't mean like uh, the house is vacant I mean like there's no house on there we we try to weed those out and don't ballot vacant properties no I, no businesses so like the filling station on the corner is not going to get a card when they're a business and we don't ballot those so anyway that, those are some of the uh, the aspects uh, of, of the, the voting process any questions any more questions on that I have a question, not on the ballot thing, and then hopefully we can wrap it up. I don't mean to take up your time, but uh, are there any downsides of the speed cushions that we haven't like thought of? I mean, just being a hundred percent honest, is there something we're going to regret this down the road or something that's going to you've seen? No, that's fair. I, no, I mean, I think you can. You know, to me, the the biggest drawback that we hear when when we hear opposition. People don't generally come out and say it, but I think it's just they don't want to drive over these every day. Sometimes we will hear that there is that they don't recognize there there is a speeding issue on the street. You know, there's probably people that aren't trying to walk and aren't in their front yard. And so, so that's fair. I mean, I don't it doesn't bother me one way or the other. Um, we hear that. And then and then the one we hear a lot um, is um, probably more an aesthetics thing. I don't think the speed cushions themselves are that are that glaring or noticeable, but um, sometimes the signage that accompanies them. Some some neighborhoods say, "Yeah, we we really don't want all those signs or something like that." So it becomes kind of an aesthetics thing. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. Those are the things that we hear the most. 
on the signage? Is the signage going to be like right by the sign, or is it going to be 10 or 15 feet in front of the sign? Because I mean, obviously, I don't live on Greens Lane, but I, I would, if I was a homeowner there and I had a sign in my front yard, I'd be more than a little upset. Yeah. So uh, I guess I'm they're questioning all, they're the, all the sign, the notification of the speed bump in relationship to, you know, how far is it from the sign to the speed bump? Yeah. And, and yeah. where are you going to put them other than in somebody's front yard? Yeah. So um, again, what I what I think is going to limit our placement of the speed cushion itself is going to be the presence of driveways. We're going to end up split, you know, finding two driveways that are kind of as far apart as we can find two driveways and putting a cushion in the middle of those. Yeah. That's probably how it's going to happen. And then the signage, it, can, we can be a little more flexible. We'll try to put it. We'll put the signage. You know, we got to keep it fairly close to the speed cushions, but we'll try to put it in, in front of a power pole or on a property line or something to make it as inconspicuous and, and um, uh, you know, as convenient as we can make a, a new sign. We recognize nope, Nobody's going to notice them at our end with that big shell station sign on the corner anyway. So I was going to say, y'all can put one in my front yard because then maybe they'll hit the sign before they hit my mailbox. Right. <laughs> Yeah. So, well, uh, and, and, take and really, here. and that and that signage can play a role. So if if we see a property that you know the ditch is real is real gradual, or they have kind of a shoulder looking thing uh, out in their yard, we know that people some some crazy people will drive around these things. Even if that means they're driving through somebody's yard. So if we see a condition like that, sometimes we will make sure that that sign goes right at the speed cushion location because they're not going to drive over that sign. It becomes kind of a, a, a preventive measure to keep people from driving around and, and going into your yard. So we will look at that too in terms of sign placement. Thank you. Um, here's my contact information. And uh, Mr. Millage, I'll, I'll reach out to you um, and just make sure you have a link to this recording so you can see all these materials. Uh, but if anybody else wants to reach out uh, to me, that's me in the green. I'm Jeff. Uh, that is also our uh, Metro representatives there. It's a generic email address because there's several staff people that have access to that and check that. So feel free to reach out to me or to the NDOT traffic calm. Uh, let me read that. NDOT traffic calming at Nashville.gov. And I am Jeff Hammond altogether at birchtransportation.com. And uh, be glad to hear from you uh, in the meantime with any things you, you may think about or we didn't cover tonight or other questions. And then, as I mentioned, here's the uh, information for uh, their website. The Metro website is trafficcalmingaltogether.nashville.gov. A lot of resources there. The map I showed you is there. The, the recordings will be there. Our process manual is there. All of the previous uh, plan sets from other neighborhoods are there. If you're curious as to how much detail we go into, um, they even have uh, past neighborhood ballot results. So how often do these pass or fail? You can scroll down through there and, and see all the results of, of different neighborhoods if you're interested. I appreciate everybody sticking with us. That was a lot of good discussion, really good feedback and some things that we certainly weren't aware of and will continue to think about. I didn't hear anything that I think makes major changes to that plan, but there may be some things. We, we will continue to follow up, uh, but we'll probably follow up with um, NDOT folks on um, speed pumps instead of cushions. If you want, you know, I heard that uh, there may be a desire for a more continuous thing without gaps in it. So we'll, we'll talk through that with them and, uh, and we'll go from there. But probably the next thing you'll um, see from us is that we'll be put on the, the website and then you'll be getting that card in the mail when we open that ballot process. Any final thoughts or questions as we wrap up here tonight? No, just want to say thank you so much, Jeff. Thank, thank you. you so much. Yeah, thank you. All. Thank you. Thank you, neighbors. Uh, George, you're in here, Ms. Sam, and I wanted to thank you for this and for presenting this, uh, echoing uh, as we all get ready to leave here, the neighbors' comments about the tractor trailer use. Um, and I, I, there is a hub request in for additional weight limit signages. I put one in 
um, to try and reinforce the FedEx traffic going to and from their lot the way that they should. Um, and uh, depending on how folks, how long they've been around here, I think early on, uh, neighbors will tell you that there was a promise that FedEx was working towards having their own access to Briley Parkway. Now that was like 30 years ago, uh, but it would be nice yeah. to see if that would, could be back on the 40 year plan that if FedEx is continuing to use this and expand the way that they are with UPS, especially FedEx would have access directly to Bradley Parkway in a long term plan. Um, and then neighbors, as far as the truck traffic, um, I will continue to stay on hub and have further conversations with Councilwoman Kimbrough uh, to try and get the traffic to follow the way they should to and from the trucking shops. Uh, so just thank you neighbors. I know we're here for safety. Um, and slowing down traffic on Green Lane. Thank you, Jeff, and uh, thank you, Katie, for sharing that on Facebook. I'll make my homeowners aware that our voting stock lies only with the homeowners that are on Green's land. Yeah, no problem. I'll post uh, information as it continues to come in from Jeff and his team, so uh, just keep on the lookout for that. Thank you so much. Sounds good. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a great Thanks, evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.